Hello and welcome back. Today I want to begin looking at the switching amplifier classes and to start things off I will be looking at the class D amplifier. Now this type of amplifier is commonly used in two main flavors. You got the wideband audio amplifier but also it's implemented as a fixed frequency RF amplifier. Today I will be focusing on the audio version and mainly look at how the circuit works and how it can be implemented. So if you're curious, then keep watching. So what is a switching amplifier? And why would it be any better than a linear amplifier? Well, amplifiers, in a similar fashion to power supplies, come in linear versions and switching versions. And just like with the power supplies, the linear versions are more inefficient in general but are also less noisy. The main reason behind this being the way in which the amplification or regulation element is used. So with the linear amplifier or linear power supply, the transistor is used as a variable resistor. Based on the signal that needs to be processed, an equivalent resistance is generated to regulate the flow of current through the circuit. So for example, if we need to generate a rising signal, so part of a sine wave for example, the equivalent resistance of the transistor will be going from a high value to a low value in a linear fashion. Because of this, the current running through the circuit will be in opposition. So we will start with a low current and go to a high current. And then the power dissipated over the transistor will have a maximum somewhere in the middle. So we will be having minimum power dissipation when the transistor is fully on or saturated, as well as when the transistor is fully off or in cutoff mode. But right here in the linear region, we will have the maximum amount of power getting dissipated over the transistor. And if we're amplifying something like a sine wave, then we will be continuously going left and right over this graph, always going through this high power dissipation area. So how could we do things differently? Now with the switching circuit, rather than using the transistor as a variable resistor, we use it as an on or off switch. So we mainly use it in its on saturated state or its off cutoff mode state. We don't use it in the linear region. So we mainly keep it at either end of this graph where power dissipation is minimal. Now it is true that to get from one state to the other you still need to go through the middle bit where we have high power dissipation. But from a time point of view the transition from one state to the other is kept to a minimal. So most of the time in a switching circuit the transistor stays at either one or the other extreme states. So switching is more efficient than using linear circuits because you're mainly keeping the transistor in its minimal power dissipation states, saturated or fully on, or in cutoff mode or fully off. And you're not keeping the transistor in its middle linear area. But by doing this, the output that we will be getting from the circuit is a square wave. So the next problem is, how do you turn a square wave into a sine wave? Well, the different classes of switching amplifiers achieve this in different ways, and the class D amplifier that we are talking about today relies on the principle of generating a square wave and then filtering it using a low-pass filter to recover a modulating signal. So if you take a square wave signal and you filter it using a low-pass filter, you will be able to get a DC output whose amplitude is equal to the on time divided by the period times the amplitude of the initial square wave. So for example, if you low pass filter a 50% duty cycle square wave, you will be getting a DC level equal to half the amplitude of the initial square wave. Now that doesn't sound very useful. However, if the duty cycle of the square wave is constantly varying, so increasing and decreasing, then the signal obtained after the low pass filter will also be increasing and decreasing. As long as you're averaging out small bits of input signal, you can recover the modulating signal from the square wave. And this is exactly the principle on which the audio class D amplifier works. You get your high efficiency because your transistors are used in a switching mode, so on and off, but after low pass filtering, you are able to recover the initial modulating signal, which can be nice and linear, and it can be over wide bandwidths. Now with class D amplifier design, there are two main topics to handle. How do you encode the linear signal into the switching signal? 
how the modulation is actually done, and second, how do you then filter out the square waves to recover the useful linear signal, and at the same time, how to prevent any unwanted electromagnetic interference. Today, we will mostly look at the first problem, and to show how this all works, we will be looking at the various signals in a circuit simulator. LT spice, of course. Now, changing the duty cycle can be done in two main ways, and I prepared a simulation to show this off. So one method is by PVM modulation pulse width modulation, and the other is by PFM pulse frequency modulation. So in both cases, the duty cycle is proportional to the input signal. It's just that the variable duty cycle is achieved in two different ways. So with pulse frequency modulation, this upper trace, we keep the on time constant, so it's always the same on time, but the period is varied, whereas with pulse width modulation, you keep the period constant, so the same frequency, but the on time is modified. Now, in most practical cases, PVM modulation is used since having a fixed frequency allows an easier way to filter out the signal, but both of these methods will work. And if we come back to the simulation, by filtering these, so starting off with the PVM signal, we do get our initial signal back, and in the same way with our PFM signal, when we filter it using a low-pass filter, we get our initial signal back. And with better filtering, you can also get better results. So here, with the output signal, we still are getting quite a large harmonic content. Now, there are two main ways in which Class D amplifiers perform the modulation. You have binary classical modulation, also known as AD modulation, and then you have ternary modulation. Now, this type is implemented in multiple ways, but we will stick to BD modulation today, just to illustrate the general behavior and the various principles involved. So, starting off with classical or AD modulation, this is the simplest one you can implement. So, the way in which this works is that you take your input signal, run it through a comparator, and you compare it to a local oscillator, which is a triangle wave or a sawtooth wave, and then with the result of the comparison, you drive the output stage. So normally you can have half an H bridge, or you can implement this as a full H bridge. And well, other than the final switching transistors, you will need an output driver that runs these transistors in phase opposition. So only one needs to be on at a time. Now, just to highlight this operation, I put some net names in the simulation. So on the input signal, the local oscillator, the switching output, and then on the load output. And if we look at the simulation results, so we have our input signal, which is a sine wave, the local oscillator is a triangle waveform, which must have a higher frequency than the input signal. Then the comparison result of the input signal being compared to the local oscillator is our switching output. So wherever this local oscillator signal intersects our initial signal, we get our transition on the output. So it goes from low to high or from high to low. So we are left with this square wave with variable duty cycle, but fixed frequency. So only the pulse width is modified, hence the pulse width modulation. And then after we filter this out, we get our output signal. Now, it's still a bit noisy because of the filter that I've chosen, but you can clearly see that it contains the initial sine wave that we've started off with. It's just that it's inverted. And regardless of whether you're using the single-ended output or the full H bridge, the same waveforms are valid for the AD modulated class D amplifier. It's just that with the H bridge implementation, you have two switching outputs in phase opposition, but the total waveform to which the load is exposed is still a square wave. Now, coming back to the half bridge, to be able to implement this, you will also need split supplies. However, you could run a half bridge output with a single power supply if you use a DC blocking capacitor in series with the load. Now, this will work, this is used with various linear amplifiers, but this brings some other problems, including a low frequency bandwidth limitation based on the capacitor and load value, as well as, if we look at the output value on the load, an initial pretty significant pop. So when you first turn on the class D output, the capacitor is completely discharged, and until it charges up with half of the supply voltage, you will be getting the charging current also running through the output load. And this will make a very clear audible pop sound. 
and with the age bridge you can do single supplies so it will all depend on whether it's easier for you to have two supplies or four transistors now if we run the simulation we should be able to see why ad modulation is not that common anymore so if we look at the output of the half bridge circuit we can see that it's switching so it will go between the two supply voltage extremes so the load will be seeing either the positive or negative supply voltage and in a similar fashion with the full bridge we get a similar story so we're either exposing the load to positive supply voltage or negative supply voltage there's only two voltages to which it can be exposed hence the term binary modulation now the significance of this is that since you're always exposing the load to some sort of non-zero voltage there will always be current running through it. So regardless of whether you're trying to amplify a specific signal or no signal, you're still switching and you're still pumping current through the load. So in this circuit, I have the half bridge implementation. The input is tied to ground. And if we check the output of the amplifier, so before the filtration, we can see this constant switching going on. And well, if we check the current through the load, even after the filtration, there still is some sort of current running through it. So one of the big reasons for having the low pass filter is to prevent all that current from running through the load all the time so that you reduce your losses. So even though class D amplifiers are supposed to be very efficient, running a demodulation is not really that efficient by switching amplifier standards. So let's see how we can improve on this a bit. Well, the next best thing is BD modulation. And it's important to point out that this can only be implemented with an age bridge type of output. So you can't really have it with a half bridge. Now it looks a bit more complicated, but we'll go through it. So with this type of modulation, you still have the input signal. You still run it through a comparator to compare it to the local triangle wave oscillator, but you're not just comparing the initial input. You're also creating an inverted version of it. So on this upper side, and you're comparing this as well to the local oscillator. So you have two comparison results, one of the input signal and one of the inverted input signal, and then you drive the output stages with these two signal results. The main benefit of this is that now we can have more combinations of switch results. So with AD modulation, you can have either the left side outputting the supply voltage and the right side outputting zero, or the other way around, the left side outputting zero and the right side outputting the supply voltage, so you have your two states, but with this new arrangement with BD modulation, you have two more extra results possible. You can have both left and right outputting zero, or both left and right outputting the supply voltage. So if we just look at how this circuit is processing an input sine wave, and we just look at the signal before the filters, we can see the three distinct output states. You have your positive supply voltage, your negative supply voltage, but you also have the zero volts output. This occurs when both sides of the age bridge are outputting the same thing, either the supply voltage or ground level. Since we have three levels, this is what's called ternary modulation. So the big advantage of this being that when you have no input signal, you can actually generate zero volts of output, therefore removing the constant current running through the output load. So with this circuit, which is the copy of the first one, there is no input signal, and here if we look at what's coming on the outputs, so the differential response of the output, we have nothing. Each individual output stage is still switching, but they're both switching at the same time with the exact same response. Only when you get some sort of input signal will these two outputs change, and the difference of them becomes something useful that can be then filtered and turned back into a sine wave. So the duty cycle that you will be getting on the load will be proportional to the input signal and its polarity will also be dependent on the input signal. If the input signal has positive polarity, then we will have a duty cycle that goes from zero to the positive supply voltage. If we have a negative input polarity, then we again have a duty cycle proportional to the input signal and going from zero to negative supply voltage. Now, another interesting result of this modulation can be observed if we compare the output signal to the local oscillator. So if we zoom in a bit, we will see that the output signal has double the frequency of the local oscillator. With higher frequencies, you can have smaller filtering components. So all in all, 
If you can afford the four transistors, you can make a far more efficient circuit by using BD modulation than you could with using AD modulation. Now, the last thing to discuss is the common mode and differential mode signal content of the two modulations. So for this I prepared the two circuits running H-bridge outputs in which the two outputs have, well, clearly defined names and I'm determining their differential mode and common mode outputs using a set of behavioral voltage sources. So for the differential mode output, I'm simply subtracting one of these outputs from the other and for the common mode, I'm adding the two up and dividing them by two. So if we run this simulation, for the AD modulation, we get our differential mode signal that we've looked at previously. But if we look at the common mode output, we get nothing. So at least with the ideal AD modulated class D amplifier, you should be getting absolutely no common mode content. The reason for this being that the two outputs are perfectly in opposition. So both when they have static values and when they are transitioning. However, in the real world, because, well, the circuit isn't perfect, you will be getting some small delays in between when one circuit switches and when the other switches. So we can illustrate this by adding a small time delay in one of the branches of the output. So for example, 100 nanoseconds on the right side output. If we do this and re-simulate, we will see that there is a difference in between when one side of the H bridge switches and when the other switches. This results in a clear common mode content. So even though the AD modulated amplifier should not have any common mode content, based on the real life imperfections, it will have more or less common mode noise. Now if we turn to the BD modulated amplifier, so here I set up the same behavioral voltage sources and we look at the output of these things. So first of all we get our differential mode output, which we've seen before, no surprises here. But we also get a very clear common mode content. So with BD modulation, it's no longer caused by imperfections in the circuitry, you will have common mode content and there's nothing you can do about it. So when it comes to filtering these class D amplifiers, you will always have differential mode noise and to a higher or smaller extent, you will also have common mode noise. Now, there are of course other more complex modulation strategies which sacrifice linearity for the benefit of efficiency. It highly depends on which of these two parameters is more important in your final design. But regardless, most modern class D amplifiers will have all of the comparators and modulation logic built into an integrated circuit. So you won't really have to be bothered with building the circuit discreetly. You just need to choose the right IC for your particular application. Now, when building such an audio amplifier though, choosing the modulation method is only half the problem. Based on the type of modulation that is implemented in the amplifier, you will need more or less filtration. There's even a thing called filterless class D amplifiers. So before attempting to filter the noise coming from an amplifier, it's critical to understand how the noise is being generated to be able to find the best possible filtration strategy. Once you understand the noise source, you can then start to do something about it. And that is the topic for next time. So for now, Hope you got some useful information after this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date on all my videos. And see you next time. Bye bye.